Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. Happy Thanksgiving. If you're in the U.S., happy Thanksgiving. Before we get to today's show, I want to let you know about a couple of quick things. The Dark Shadows Dynamo herself, Catherine Lee Scott, will be making an appearance at the Mad Monster Expo in Atlanta, Georgia, and that will be happening on November 17th through the 19th. You can find out more at madmonster.com. Sounds like a really great event. Speaking of great events, I had an absolute blast at Collinwood again at the TV Collinwood this time uh, over Halloween weekend, actually on the Sunday before Halloween going into the Monday. I went to uh, a gathering at Seaview Terrace, also known as the Cary Mansion, but best known as Collinwood. And uh, I had a blast. I saw many familiar and friendly faces there and had a really nice time. I met some new friends there. It was a blast and I'm so glad I went. And I mentioned this was coming in an earlier episode, but issue two of Monster Mag magazine is out. It's the magazine devoted to independent New England horror, and it features an interview by Jeff Rigo with yours cruelly, Penny Dreadful, with a cover painting, an oil painting by the illustrious Daniel Horn. I am very honored. Uh, the interview is, gee, it's a big interview. It's, a, I don't know, maybe 14 pages long with photos and lots of cool stuff. Um, I do talk about Dark Shadows in it quite a bit, uh, including uh, the podcast and just Dark Shadows in general. Jeff Rigo asked some incredible questions uh, for that interview. I was really happy with uh, with how it turned out. Um, so if you want to check it out, it's at monstamag.com and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And on a related note, I will be doing a signing and appearance at JR's A Spooky Shack, which is located at 104 Forest Avenue in Hudson, Massachusetts. And that'll be happening on December 2nd, 2023 from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's a cool store that has all kinds of spooky stuff for sale. Also appearing is Dream Killer Cosplay and I believe they'll be there as the Grinch. Uh, so it'll be fun. And uh, as always, I will have Terror at Collinwood stickers at my table. And if you are a Terror at Collinwood listener, come and let me know and I will give you a free sticker. So I hope to see you there. As you may have noticed, this episode's a little bit late and that might be the case for the next few months. In addition to assorted Penny Dreadful activities, I'm a college English professor and I have over a hundred students this semester. Unwisely, I took on a fifth class, uh, an accelerated uh, English class, uh, which is a short story class and it's really fun, but the, uh, I guess, drawback with teaching uh, English is uh, the essay grading. It's just constant piles of essays. So uh, between that and uh, I'm also in a production of Clue right now. I'm playing Mrs. White, the Madeline Kahn part. So uh, I am doing that out in Cape Cod at the Falmouth Theater Guild, and I'm in rehearsals for that right now. And that's not going to open until the beginning of February, but they started rehearsals quite early for this because there's a lot of physical comedy in this, a lot of movement and a lot of set changes. And the cast is just phenomenal. It's over at the Falmouth Theater Guild. So if those who are uh, local in the uh, Massachusetts area or Rhode Island area, uh, if you want to come out and see Clue in February, I'll, uh, I'll mention it when I get closer to that time. But uh, between that, the podcast, the Penny stuff, and the, the day job, I am just kind of burning the blue candles at both ends here. Uh, so apologies for a late delivery on some of these upcoming episodes. With that said, let's get to today's show and I can't wait to get to it. Hostess Penny Dreadful, and I must transform myself into. 
Danielle. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I'm going to do something a little different. I haven't done a solo episode in a while and I've been meaning to. I love speaking with my guests. I've had so many fun conversations on this podcast, um, but it's been a while since I've done a solo episode and I really wanted to get back to talking a little bit about storylines and characters. So every so often I'm going to put one of these out. Some of you may remember a series of books put out years ago by Dale Clark of the Inside the Old House fanzine. And Dale published a series called The Dark Shadows Book of Questions and Answers. Uh, He actually did eight volumes of this book series. And he tackled plot and character questions mostly with some behind the scenes stuff too. So in honor of that, I'm going to start releasing The Dark Shadows podcast of questions and answers in the spirit of Dale's publications. Every fan has their own very passionate perception of things or things that they want to talk about. And that's totally cool. And I love that. I love hearing different viewpoints and the the spectrum of ideas that's presented on this show is something I adore and I I want to keep that going. But I also have opinions and I I like devoting occasional episodes to discussing theories that are just my interpretations and my theories. And we're going into real geeky territory here. I mean, every episode of this podcast is geeky territory, but this is going to be the deep end of the pool, kids. I mean, I've always been a huge fan of things like Warren Odson's articles where he speculates about Dark Shadows, storylines, characters, plots, uh, Dale Clark's books of questions and answers, or the Collinsport Debating Society and the World of Dark Shadows. Uh, I mean, these were the types of discussions that you would see in fanzines and in the Dark Shadows forums too, where people deep dive into plot speculation and debate different things. I love that kind of stuff and I I don't see as much of it anymore. Anyway, when it comes to things like Dark Shadows storylines, or if there are errors in Dark Shadows storylines or plot inconsistencies, you will very rarely hear me say, well, the writers just forgot. I I don't say that. I don't say things like the writers just didn't care. Um, That kind of explanation for things to me is is boring. There's no imagination involved. It's the true answer. It's the real world answer, but we're we're not dealing with a real world. We're dealing with a story, with a a piece of fiction that we can explore. And we have to look at that, uh, that piece of fiction through the secondary world lens. Uh, If you listen to the Gothic world building episode I did with uh, Dr. Andrew Higgins uh, and our discussion about primary world versus secondary world, you'll know what I mean. I tend to take a more formalist approach when it comes to um, examining texts. Formalism is a school of literary theory and criticism that focuses only on the work itself and completely ignores the author of the work, um, the time and background information of the work, and the audience's feelings or perceptions of the work. It's a study of the text without taking into account any outside influence. In other words, I'm looking at the story itself in a self-contained Dark Shadows universe and how that story functions. I'm not looking at Gordon Russell and Sam Hall forgot what they said three years earlier. That's irrelevant. Within the story itself, there is no Sam Hall and Gordon Russell. There is the Dark Shadows universe and characters and how does something that was said three years earlier, how is it completely different three years later? So we are only using the story itself to try to figure that out with the clues that were given to us and perhaps with the characteristics of the gothic genre itself. Yes, I am aware that the writers sometimes forgot things or they just decided to retcon things and change things things. But if we're examining this as a piece of fiction, uh, we're going to look at it as a story in and of itself, and we're going to try to make sense of it. And that's what I love doing. Inconsistencies are just opportunities for exploration. So I I have a set of seven questions. If you have questions you want me to address plot and character wise, please feel free to send them my way and I will try to incorporate them into a future episode. So question number one, in the pre-Barnabas episodes, it's stated that Lefreniere is Josette's maiden name and that she died in 1830. How is this possible when we saw that her maiden name is Dupre and she died in 1795 or 1796? There are a couple of possibilities that come to mind here. Option one is that in episode 971, we saw a book thrown in from parallel time, from the parallel time room into the main time band. So we know this can happen. So what if this isn't the first time that this happened? Somehow a copy or multiple copies of the Collins family history from alternate bands of time found their way into the primary time band and the Collins family are unwittingly citing material from sources that come from parallel universes without knowing. So the, you know, the dates don't line up. Uh, Even if this is a parallel time band, one is, it says 1834. When we saw it happen in 1795, 1796, time is shifting, right? So if we look at 1841, 
one parallel time, Collinwood existed in 1680, over 100 years before it existed in primary time. So what's to say in some parallel universe that Josette, a Lafreniere, the, the lineage was a little different. She was born a little later in 1830s. It's a bit of a stretch, but it's a, it's a possibility. We also know that the actual Collins family history was purposely falsified to cover up the horrors of the past. And I think there are multiple versions of the Collins family history that were commissioned by Joshua Collins to obfuscate the truth. There isn't only one. He had multiple versions of it published with slightly different information in each one to blur the lines even more. And the cherry on top, picture it, Carl Collins writes a fake Collins family history book, has it published, and puts it on the shelf for the rest of the Collins family history books as the ultimate practical joke on future generations. Because you know Carl Collins wants to prank his descendants. For sure, he's going to have a fake Collins family history done up totally bogus, 100% BS, puts it on the shelf with all the rest of them. And on top of this, we have books coming in from parallel universes, fake Collins family history books from the main time band, what is the truth? What is reality? No one can tell. It's a mess. People are citing history that either never existed or it comes from a parallel band of time. It's all over the place. I can totally see this happening. It would certainly muddy the waters enough to have a lot of mixed up information for those seeking accurate information. And of course, as we know, the Collins family history is not particularly famous for its accuracy. It, it's, it's fun to think that Barnabas perused one of these parallel time texts while he was at Collinwood and told that version of the story to Julia in episode 345 when he's on Widow's Hill. Maybe he was kind of messing with her and, and pulling information from that. Or maybe Angelique magically scrambled his memories during one of her pilgrimages to the secret room in the Collins Mausoleum between 1795 and 1840. Now, another option that comes to mind, another possibility is the idea of incursions by other timelines into the primary time band. I really dislike the idea of explaining away discrepancies in the plot by saying that we've entered a completely new parallel universe every time something like that happens, because I like the idea that the present day family is the family that we have followed all the way through. Every time we're in the present day, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, and that little smidge of 71, and when we were in the present, that's always the same family. I don't like the idea that it's like, oh, we're in, it's every time it's a parallel universe. However, I mean, with all of the time travel in Dark Shadows and the existence of a portal into parallel universes in the house itself, and the fact that we could argue that Collinwood is built on cursed land or that it, an, an enchanted ground, that's never stated in the show, but it's a kind of an idea that I, that I certainly like. I mean, it's not impossible that other timelines may be bleeding through and mixing in with the primary time band. So we have some things that really took place in this primary time band, but other timelines are seeping in to the main time band and altering things. If we add this to the possibility that the grounds of Collinwood and the Collinwood estate are somehow innately enchanted or cursed, then all of these hazy time things start to compound even further. And that could even explain the ever-changing dates on the gravestones or 1795, 1796, 1797. Where did 1797 come from? Like things are shifting and changing and time is becoming hazy. This timey-wimey stuff is going on. I like to imagine that Barnabas and Julia would eventually have to deal with a serious danger to the timeline due to all of this tampering with the past and from things they did in parallel time too. They didn't belong in parallel time in 1970. Maybe what they did there is also having an effect on Collinwood, but it would be interesting to imagine something like that, like what would happen if they kept tampering with, with time. It's certainly an interesting thing to try to wrap your head around. And if anybody has other theories, I'd love to hear them. Okay, question two, who was Abner Collinwood? whose portrait hung outside the playroom during the summer of 1970. My guess is that he was Flora's husband who died prior to the events of 1840. We never found out who Flora's husband was. Flora is this Collins who lives on the estate, but where did Flora come from? What is her lineage? We don't know for sure, but I mean, certainly there were probably other members of the Collins family around. Um, the Collins family is an old family. Maybe there were other branches of the family, but I'm guessing Abner was 
was probably Flora's husband. Maybe he was one of the family members who was still in England and came over. Possibly Daniel and Millicent had uh, yet another cousin, Cousin Abner, who came to Collinwood after uh, Joshua's death. The way they talk about Abner Collins, it seems like he was around. It was like the letters about the playroom and things like this, and his portrait was outside the playroom. I'm going to say he's probably Flora's husband and Desmond's father. Question three, how did Quentin end up sealed in his room in 1897? So we have to look at the tidbits that happened prior to the changing of history due to the presence of Barnabas, Angelique, and Julia in 1897. They weren't meant to be there the first time around. I think what originally happened in 1897 was probably much darker and even more traumatic for all the parties involved. Quentin, as a werewolf, probably was the one who killed Carl. He Maybe he even killed Nora, which is horrible to say, but we never hear about Nora at all. Quentin, as a werewolf, killed his brother and his niece. Side note, it's also possible that Laura succeeded in taking Nora into the flames when she returned in 1897. She didn't succeed with Jameson, but it's possible she did succeed with Nora, so that's also another possibility. And Jameson certainly learned about all of this and turned on him. Judith and Edward took it in their own hands to deal with this situation, and they may have killed him with the silver bullet in that room, and he fell into the chair, transformed back into his human form. And remember, there there was one of the clues that led to Quentin's death. First one was that a silver bullet was found at Collinwood, but in the version of events we saw, that silver bullet didn't really end up playing a role unless Beth shot him with the silver bullet in the altered version of events because she shoots Quentin. So maybe it wasn't that silver bullet, but I honestly, I think the bullet that Quentin's ghost is talking about to David in that dream sequence was used by Edward and Judith to kill Quentin as a werewolf in that room. Uh, And he fell back into the chair, transformed back into his human form. And why wasn't he buried? Maybe it was out of superstition. He was sealed in there. I could see them getting like Magda even to cast some kind of spell of protection to keep Quentin's spirit confined in that room, knowing that he would become a malevolent spirit perhaps. And Jameson would never mention Uncle Quentin again, but it was David and Amy were the link that was needed to finally break him out of that room. They are the ones who successfully got Quentin out of there. I think the, the events, original run of events of 1897 were probably much darker, and that certainly was Quentin's skeleton in that room. I mean, the, it ended up being Trask in the altered version of events, but the original run of events, that wasn't Trask, it was Quentin. Somehow he ended up in that room. So we can only put the pieces together to figure figure that stuff out. Uh, I'm not going to tackle 1840 today because that's a, that's a whole other kettle of fish from the cannery because that's a lot to unpack with 1840 uh, in a future one. I will do that. By the way, side note, I do have a theory about the family secret in 1840 and why it wasn't there. Daniel didn't seem to know the family secret. And it's if you look at Dale Clark's books, I'm thinking along the same lines Dale was with the answer to that one. But that's a, that's for another episode. Question four. In episode 481, there's a famous blooper where Barnabas tries to stop Julia from calling the police by saying, Julia, remember someone. And then Dr. Lang jumps in with Dave Woodard. How can Lang know about Dave Woodard? So, of course, the, the real world, the primary world reason we know, of course, is that Jonathan Frid forgot the name he was supposed to say, so Addison Powell prompted him. But we don't care about primary world reasons here. Only in-universe reasons allowed. Now, so some fans might say, well, there's no reason why Dr. Lang should know about Dave Woodard. There's no explanation for this. I disagree. Collinsport is a small main town. Dr. Lang and Dr. Woodard were both doctors in Collinsport, so of course they knew each other. I'd even venture a guess uh, that Woodard at some point hinted to Lang about the things he was uncovering, uh, which would have made Lang suspicious when Dr. Woodard suddenly died. So he might not have known what happened, but he knew something was going on. And don't think the Dr. Frankenstein of Collinsport wouldn't have brought all of that up to Barnabas when he finally put two and two together. Barnabas at that point was more buddy buddy with Lang and he probably copped to the whole thing when Lang confronted him with it. So when Barnabas says remember someone hoping that Julia would catch his drift without having to go there and say the actual name, Dr. Lang just went and for the gusto and blurted it out and said Dave Woodard because he knew that was going to cinch it, right? It makes sense to me that Lang would actually have put the pieces together after discovering Barnabas uh, who probably later admitted to it. Maybe even with a warning to Dr. Lang that the same thing could happen to him if he betrays him. I could see Barnabas 
saying something like that. That one is, to me, is a very easy one to explain. Bloopers, come on, shame on you. No such thing. There are no bloopers. It all, it all happens for a reason, I swear. So question five, is Barnabas a hero or a villain? The answer is obviously yes. Problem solved. There we go. There's, a, there's your answer. Yes. Barnabas is both and neither. I strongly suggest watching Jonathan Fritz's interview for the 80s Dark Shadows PBS special, which is a bonus feature on the Blu-ray and DVD for Dark Shadows and Beyond the Jonathan Fritz story. It's maybe the best interview I've heard with Jonathan Fritz because he really talks about Barnabas, the nitty gritty of Barnabas and how, what inspired him in his portrayal of Barnabas and how he sees the character. It's fantastic. I'd strongly suggest checking that out if you haven't seen it. And of course, the documentary itself, that goes without saying. But that interview with Frid is, is really good. Jonathan Frid talks about his two inspirations for Barnabas, Macbeth and Richard III. Not traditional heroes by any means. Macbeth is a tragic hero. He's a flawed hero. He's not a villain per se. He's a complex character like Barnabas. And a tragic hero isn't, it's not good guys and bad guys. Like the, he has a, a flaw. He's ambitious. And he becomes a murderer thanks to the prophecy that he's going to be king. He kills Duncan, spurred on by Lady Macbeth. And then he becomes paranoid after he becomes king. Like Barnabas, he's very paranoid, you know, and he kills all of these other people. He is a classic tragic hero. And Richard III, who you could argue is a villain. I mean, he is a manipulative, twisted, brilliant dude. And here's a, a great description of Richard III uh, that I found online here. Richard's most powerful tool is language. He's able to convince people through his monologues and oration to commit heinous acts. He blames his evil on his deformities and tries to elicit sympathy from the audience. An audience wants him to succeed out of respect for his deep malevolence. You know, there, there's that in Barnabas too, especially early Barnabas, but there are aspects of that in Barnabas that remain with the character as well. You still root for Barnabas even when he's doing things that are shady as hell, but you like Barnabas, you want to follow his story. And instead of a physical deformity, it's the curse. It's the, the vampirism that he's struggling against, he elicits sympathy that way and what he has lost because of that. But with Richard III, Jonathan Frid infused that character with a conscience. He pulled that out of Shakespeare's text, but he he picked up on the conscience element of Richard III, which a lot of actors don't, because when he does display a conscience, it seems out of place given what he has done prior to this and what he has expressed prior to this. And I'm pulling this quote from a, an online source here. From his very first soliloquy in Act One, Richard seems immune to his own conscience and is determined to prove a villain. His sudden attack of conscience in Act 5 seems out of place as he has had no previous second thoughts about murdering people, even his own relatives. Jonathan Frid felt that Richard III did have a conscience and Frid played into that. He leaned into that in his portrayal of Richard III, which I wish I could see. I wish I could see his performance of Richard. I've heard, you know, clips of scenes that he did on his website and things like that. But um, uh, the way Frid described playing him sounds very similar to the way he played Barnabas. So you can see those rivers that fed into Barnabas Collins uh, came from Macbeth and Richard III. And if you have not seen those plays, please go see them either live in the theater or watch the film versions. Um, and, and in this interview, Jonathan Frid goes on to say he likes to play between two poles, meaning good and evil, right? So Frid liked playing the shades of gray. And then he reads this piece about Barnabas. Uh, is, it's Barnabas talking about his morality and whether he's good or evil. I believe this piece was written by a fan, but Jonathan loved this piece and he'd read it at festivals and things. And he read it in this interview. We performed it, actually. It was a performance piece, like a monologue. Um, for the most part, I would say Barnabas is an anti hero. He does some really bad things, and sometimes he does those bad things to accomplish good things, like protecting his new family in the present, but he's also a brutal killer and an undead creature who feeds on victims, and sometimes he kills them. Uh, but he has a soul and a conscience, and he wants to do the right thing. He tries to do the right thing, and, and sometimes he does. He's kind of like, I guess we're going to take it to, to the comic book realm, he's kind of like the Marvel's Punisher, in a way. You know, the Punisher is not Captain America or Superman, you would say the Punisher is a hero because he's killing gangsters, but he's severely damaged and he's 
brutally killing people over and over again, relentlessly. And yeah, it's usually bad guys uh, that the Punisher is killing, but he's uh, he decides who lives and who dies. He makes that. The Punisher decides every time who lives and who dies, just like Barnabas. Barnabas actually doesn't even, sometimes he, he will kill innocent people. I mean, but Barnabas is a complex character. He might be fighting for what he believes is a noble cause, but his methods are often questionable. And honestly, Barnabas is all over the map. You could argue that Barnabas starts as a tragic hero. Hero in 1795. He actually is a pretty nice guy, but he's flawed. He can't keep it in his pants when it comes to Angelique. And then he's, you know, he's in love with Josette, blah, 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 blah. And he casts off Angelique. Barnabas is a, a tragic hero at the beginning. Um, then he becomes an anti-villain uh, after he becomes a vampire in 1795, as opposed to an anti-hero. He's more of an anti-villain in the uh, latter half of uh, after he becomes a vampire in 1795. When he's released from his coffin by Willie in the present day, he's as close to a villain as he gets. He's almost still an anti-villain. He's like like 95% villain, but there's 5%. There's 5% there that that glimmer which I remember as a kid, like you could catch that. And he did it intentionally. He wanted to make Barnabas sympathetic, as did the writers like Ron Sprout. You know, they intentionally infused the character with that. So it's like, even then it's like, well, he's not, all bad. There's more. He's complex. And that's what I love about Barnabas. So at that time, but then he develops into an anti-hero. And for the bulk of the series, I would say he is uh, an anti-hero. And sometimes he leans more in the full-on hero direction. And sometimes he leans more in the in the evil direction. Sometimes he leans in the good direction. Sometimes he leans in the in the evil direction. I would say that Barnabas remains an anti-hero. Um, he could do monstrous and disturbing things sometimes, but he could also also do really selfless and brave things too. And I love that mix. I think boiling it down to Barnabas is a hero, Barnabas is a villain, it's simplifying it too much. And Jonathan Frid didn't want to do that. I always go back to what he says about how he enjoys playing characters. He says, if they're bad, he puts some good in there. If they're good, he puts some bad in there. And if it goes too far in one direction or the other, he, he likes to counterbalance that with the other. And it's fascinating. It really is. I dig that. It's part of what made the character a hit because you don't want to you don't want to nerf the vampire by making him like a goody two-shoes vampire. Part of why we like Barnabas is that he is a he is a vampire. He's a supernatural creature. He can be a monster, but there's a human soul in the monster. And uh, Jonathan Ford even says that in that piece that he performs at the end of that interview, that he says something to that effect. And so I think just calling him a hero or calling him a villain or calling him good or calling him evil is just putting him in a box. And didn't he already spend enough time in one of those? So let's move on to the next question. What are the Leviathans? Are they meant to be aliens? Only in the sense that uh, they ain't from around these parts. They don't come from around here. Uh, they're described by Angelique as creatures of the underworld. Uh, to put them in some kind of context, because I think the audience was baffled by what they, we were dealing with. So we're like, well, let's put them as underworld creatures and put them in the context of something more demonic. All right. That's, that's affiliated with Nicholas Blair and Diabolos, because I think it was easier for people to grasp that perhaps. But the Leviathans were Dark Shadow's attempt at Lovecraftian or cosmic horror, which grew out of weird fiction. So you need to look at cosmic horror, Lovecraftian horror, which um, emphasizes the unknowable and the incomprehensible. We are dealing with entities that defy categorization and human comprehension. We're talking beings, dark deities from incomprehensible realms and and their elements of the occult and the supernatural woven into all of that it's not ufos uh, or you know technology from from outer space um you want to read something like the dunwich horror which is the primary inspiration for the leviathan storyline but there there's also uh, when rick lay was on here he he mentioned some echoes of robert e howard too some of his works so um it's pulling from weird fiction pulling from cosmic horror which grew out of gothic horror and there are elements of gothic horror in Lovecraftian horror. Lovecraft was a fan of that stuff too, but it's a departure as well. Um, it rejects the traditional monsters of gothic horror, the traditional supernatural beings, and creates incomprehensible new creatures we, we cannot wrap our heads around. And there's a deep nihilism to cosmic horror, to Lovecraftian horror, 
that I can see would probably make Dark Shadows viewers at the time very uncomfortable. But I think this is why uh, it was difficult for viewers at the time to absorb what was going on with the Leviathans. It is difficult to absorb Lovecraftian horror in, in comparison to the more familiar horrors of the Gothic. When we're dealing with vampires and ghosts and witches and werewolves, we know what that is. And there are a lot of elements of Gothic horror that carry over into weird fiction and to, into Lovecraft. Crafty and horror as well, but it's it's different. It's its own distinct subgenre. So introducing cosmic horror into a gothic show, I think that was jarring for some people. Not to mention the fact that the Barnabas we'd gotten used to as as antihero was now brainwashed by the Leviathans and coldly villainous. Even at his worst, Barnabas always exhibited emotion, even if it was violent emotion. Sometimes he was passionate, you know, as a vampire or as a human. But here he was cold and under the control of a higher power. So now this is, uh, viewers did not react well to this as well. So that was another component to this, but I'm getting off track here. If fans maybe knew Lovecraft going in, it wouldn't have been as jarring, but I think a lot of fans at that time hadn't read Lovecraft and it translated for them into Leviathans are sci-fi space aliens. Or I I remember in fanzines too, people referencing the blob, the fifties movie, that was their frame of reference was the blob. And that was the only thing they could kind of draw the parallel to is not the same thing. There are, in cosmic horror and in weird fiction, there can be elements of science fiction in there, but we're not dealing with technology here. And in fact, you're dealing with the occult and the supernatural, like gothic stuff, which is also in cosmic horror. Things like the Leviathan book are analogous to the Necronomicon in Lovecraft. That's that's what that came from. And the, the Leviathans conduct rituals and they have cultists and there's all this, you know, prophecy and all these kind of things that are not sci-fi and space aliens in the traditional sense that we think of science fiction, but instead are certainly much more uh, related to, to the occult, to the supernatural, to magic. Even with Frankenstein, it's a gothic horror novel, but it's often cited as the first science fiction novel as well. But even with Frankenstein, if we look at Adam, the Adam and Eve storyline, it's like mad science. A true science fiction novel is going to go into how that stuff works. The the author is going to try to explain to you how that works. We're dealing instead with a distrust of science, which comes from romanticism. You know, the the romantics, one of the the characteristics of romanticism is we don't trust science. We don't trust industrialization, right? Um, uh, This could lead to bad things. When we read Frankenstein or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, we see where that type of science leads, but it doesn't go into the doodads. And Frankenstein, the novel, it, Mary Shelley doesn't go into deep descriptions of how the monster was created and brought to life. It's kind of hazy, just like on Dark Shadows. It's like lab equipment in Lang's house or an, and then later in the old house basement. But we don't know how that stuff works. We don't know how Julia built Eve and brought her to life or how Dr. Lang what went into transferring Barnabas's life force into it's mad science it's uh, it's philosophical it's metaphysical it's science yeah but it's a, a a dash of science fiction in a boiling soup of terror and with the Leviathans it's even further removed I think from science fiction and and stuff like aliens we're dealing with these primordial beings that predate mankind which then somehow become affiliated with Satan at some point they're they they've become Become part of the other. Maybe they were always affiliated with Satan, like in the Dark Shadows universe. Don't so with Lovecraft. There's no Satan. Uh, there's no devil in Dark Shadows. There is. There's a devil in Dark Shadows who is in charge of the Leviathans or puts Nicholas in charge of the Leviathans. So now we have recontextualized what they went in with initially, which was much more Lovecraft stuff. And it kind of then became a hybrid between Lovecraft. They dialed it back to Gothic horror, which is much more Judeo-Christian in nature. Lovecraft is not. Lovecraft, no God, no devil. There are deities, but they look upon you with indifference and cruelty. And usually you're basically an ant to these beings. So remember, we're working with the story itself. So regardless of whatever the writers intended to have these Lovecraftian beings, they still kind of are, but they become uh, hybridized with sort of something more demonic from the underworld that's affiliated with, with the devil. And that is where it went. And that's what we have to work with. So we're dealing with something that's a hybrid between something Lovecraftian and something satanic as well. 
uh, is a combination of the two. Since they predate mankind, I'm going to say that Diabolos learned about the Leviathans very early on. Shortly after mankind shows up, uh, I could see Diabolos enlisting the Leviathans uh, into his army of the damned, I guess, <laughs> or making them part of his forces. There is going to be something mutually beneficial there. So I could see that being the case. Read the Dunwich Horror for a better understanding of the Leviathans, Dunwich Horror. I also suggest reading The Call of Cthulhu, which is Lovecraft's most famous story. Uh, Dreams in the Witch House is a really good one too. It just gives you a better understanding of the content of that storyline. And, co- and just for the content of Dark Shadows in general, reading or watching the source material is always recommended. That will enrich the experience, I I think. Dan Curtis didn't think those stories were boring because he wanted to use them in his show. In fact, I talked to a listener recently at a convention who was so nice and came to the table and he said because of listening to the 1841 Parallel Time episode discussion on this podcast, he went and watched Wuthering Heights, the classic film version with Laurence Olivier and uh, Merle Oberon, the, the 1939 film, which is a, a, a fantastic film. And he, he enjoyed the film, um, but I, I think it helps put into perspective the whole Bramwell and Catherine and Morgan thing in 1841 parallel time because then you see oh they're pulling from this gothic romance story so and I think that goes for any dark shadow storyline read gothic novels or watch gothic films or in the instance of the Leviathans cosmic horror which is a, a distinct subgenre with some overlap that comes from the gothic but with weird fiction which also plays into the Leviathans and cosmic horror we're looking at more things that are getting away from the traditional ghosts and vampires and witches and going into something unknowable and, and which would drive one mad to look upon, look, look at how people react when they see Jeb in his true form. You you can't look at that without losing your mind. Uh, th- this is another Lovecraft thing. It Once you see that, you can't unsee it. It drives you to madness. And, and like Lovecraft said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. We can't really comprehend what the Leviathans are. The best we get is creatures of the underworld. And the final question, why was Amy Jennings called Molly at first? Molly is most likely Amy's middle name. Some people like to be called by their middle name. And maybe Amy went through a phase where she insisted that Chris and Tom call her Molly. There might be a reason for this. Maybe there's maybe there's a sad reason behind it. And then perhaps she embraced her first name of Amy while she was at Wincliffe. Or it could be the reverse. Uh, maybe her first name was Molly and she wanted to be called Amy. So everybody started calling her Amy. Another example of this is uh, Timothy Elliot Stokes, who probably at some point asked his friends to start referring to him by his middle name of Elliot because they were calling him Timothy when they first met him. And then all of a sudden they're calling him Elliot. And in the credits, he's T. Elliot Stokes. So he probably said, I prefer to be called Elliot. But it's probably something like that. And maybe it was something similar with Amy where she went through a period where she wanted to be known by her middle name for some reason. All right. I think that's enough. The next time I do one of these, I'll address us seven more questions and I'll attempt to answer them. And if there's any question you want answered, send it my way and I will try my best to address it. And if you have thoughts to share about my answers to these questions, if you want to add anything or if you disagree or agree and you want to add your thoughts in the YouTube version of these shows, you can leave comments uh, for the audio uh, version. Unfortunately, there I don't see any place for comments on these through the feeds that go to the different uh, apps. I know the YouTube one, you can leave comments. Please be respectful. Uh, if you don't agree with uh, things that I've said or that my guests have said, that is fine. But please be respectful in your response. I have seen a couple of responses to guests that I've had on the podcast that I deleted because they were not nice. I don't play that game. This is not what this podcast is for. I want this podcast to be fun. I want it to be a celebration of dark shadows and uh, it's it's good times all around. It's not to have battles and denigrate anyone. Uh, we can disagree with each other, but we don't have to be impolite about it. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If I get this episode up before Thanksgiving, it will be a Thanksgiving miracle and I will have something to be thankful for because I will have gotten this out. I, I, I don't know at this point. It is 
pre-Thanksgiving right now, and I'm really hoping to get this out by Thanksgiving. So have a great Thanksgiving if you listen to this before Thanksgiving or on Thanksgiving. If you're in a country that celebrates Thanksgiving uh, in November, uh, I know Canada does it in October, but uh, actually the vast majority of listeners to this podcast are in the U.S., but um, they're actually like the number two is U the U.K., then is Canada was number three. And then there are several other countries that tune into the podcast, uh, but the vast majority are in the U.S. But wherever you are listening to Terror at Collinwood, I want you to know that I'm thankful for your listenership. Thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for commenting, liking, subscribing, rating, reviewing, writing in for donations that you've made through Buy Me a Coffee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really do very much sincerely appreciate it. And my dog, Crispy, is letting me know that I should be paying attention to her instead of talking into this microphone. So with that said, join me next time for Terror at Collinwood. And for as long as they lived, the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be Terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.